Good evening and welcome to Cornerstone. Thank you so much for showing up today, whether you're here on campus or if you're watching us online, we sure do hope um, that you will have a blessing from this evening, all right? I don't think Pastor Mitch, Pastor Salzer is gonna let me preach again. Um, I think I scared everybody off. I apologize for that, all right? No, I'm just kidding. Let's all stand, page 495, look up at the screen. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, a day I'll never forget. When heaven came down and glory filled my soul, lift it up with us on that first verse. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling he made all the darkness depart. singing. Thank you so much for singing out. Uh, Brother Joe is going to come and open us in prayer this evening. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for bringing us here this evening and uh, just be with Pastor Mitchell as he's bringing a message through your word and let it just speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. Page 357. Page 357. I am so glad. Jesus loves even me, a sinner even like me, amen. Page 357, look up at the screen, all three verses this evening. I am so glad. Okay, here we go, sorry. Forgot the tune for a minute, I apologize. Here we go, verse number one. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see.
you're sounding so good, you can go ahead and be seated. Thank you again so much for um, standing and singing out this evening. All right, Brother Dave is going to come and uh, as we conduct our offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for this great day that you've given to us. We thank you for um, the great message by Brother James this morning, and we're looking forward to Pastor Mitchell tonight for what he has for us. We thank you for the music that just softens our hearts and prepares our hearts for the for the word. We thank you, Lord, for your people who who are so willing to give and are faithful. And we pray, God, that you bless this offering now. We thank you for it. For us in Christ's precious name, amen. Amen. What a wonderful message. Hopefully you were, uh, were blessed because of that song. One more song this evening. You can go ahead and stand up if you want to. Just kidding. Go ahead and stand with me. I was going to let you sit down, but I'm like, no, if I'm standing, we should all stand. All right? Just kidding. Page 275. How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord. Lift it up on the, last, on the first verse. Page 275. How firm a foundation. How firm a Shun ye saints of the Lord, it is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus? 
Thank you so much. Go ahead and grab your Bibles as Pastor Mitchell comes to preach to us this evening. Amen. Thank you and good evening. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. Looking forward to preaching. I'm excited that the pastor asked me. Uh, Somebody asked me a while ago, are you nervous? And... uh, you know, I've, you're always a little anxious when you preach because you want to, it's God's word. You want to be clear. But I, I'm real comfortable now because uh, I called some people yesterday that I know, at least two different ones that I know that love me and pray for me, ask them if they'd be here, and they're here. So I want to thank you for coming. I am not going to call your names. I'm just glad to see you. I feel better that you're here. So I'm sure that we'll preach better now that you're here. Psalm 119, if you would please. We're going to read the first eight verses right now. uh, And then we're going to uh, cover eight more verses as we go through the message. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they, they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, as we consider some thoughts from your word today uh, about man and about the scriptures and about what you have to say to us and what they will do for us if we just keep our minds fixed upon your word. We just ask your blessing upon every person here tonight and we give you thanks for them in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As we look at these first two sections of Psalm 119, the author is unknown. We're not real sure who it is, but indications are that it was a suffering saint uh, that endured some things, contempt and ill treatment. Uh, Maybe uh, one of the minor prophets is considered in this to be the author of the psalm. But the psalm is arranged in a a, a different way. It's around a simple theme of God's law. And it's written with the passion of a poet, in love with the Lord, and in love with his law. The general scope and design is to magnify the divine law, the divine word of God that we have. By the way, this should be all of our design, 
all of our desire, all of our concerns in this world is to base what we believe and practice and talk and share with people based upon what God has said, not what we think, not what we feel, but God's word. This particular psalm consists of 22 stanzas, each consisting of eight verses, as we read the first eight, and each emphasizes in order a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so if you notice when you, you begin uh, to read uh, Psalm 19, you had uh, uh, a little script up at the top, that's a Hebrew letter. And so it's ranged in that order. That's enough of the background. Let's talk about what the psalm does. Let's talk about what the word does. Let's talk about what we do with the word and what the word will do with us if we give it a chance. Verse 1 through 3, we begin to look and, uh, and verse 1 it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they. Well, the word of God rules in our way as we walk. If we walk in the right path, if we listen to what God has to say, if we meditate in the thoughts in God's word, it's going to direct our paths. And he says, blessed are, are they that walk or keep his testimonies. Also in verse 2, uh, but they're blessed for that. Now, the word rendered way is found 13 times in this psalm. And it could be a synonym for God's word. Here's the fact. You and I can always choose the way we walk. We can choose the path that we take. We can choose the narrow way. We can choose the broad way. We can choose the way of the Lord. We can choose the way of man. We can choose the way of our own heart and desires. Or we can choose the way that God has laid out for us. You and I make choices every day. And as we make those cho choices, we're choosing how we walk. We're choosing the direction that we take. We're choosing what we are actually becoming as his people. Most people see the Bible as unsatisfactory. Now, when you first think of that, that doesn't sound right. But how many people... Would, would, have you tried to talk to or I know I have over the years so many that basically are saying put that book away uh, when you begin to quote from it they don't believe it or they don't want it to rule their lives but the Bible will do some things for you it will bless you it will keep you if you walk in the right path to the unsaved the Bible is a book of gloom that's the reason they don't want to hear it that's the reason they ignore it. But blessed or happy is the overflow of joy that we have if we maintain God's word in our heart. Blessed are the undefiled in his way. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. As we look at the first two verses there, we see that there's a blessing there. Blessed are happy. That's the overflow of joy. Joy is the source. Happiness is the stream that comes into our life. Now, God weds happiness to holiness. That's why the unsaved never truly find happiness. They're looking. They're experimenting. They're trying everything that they can find to meet the needs of this flesh but they just never find it. So many rich people have killed themselves. Why? You would think with all they have, they can buy everything they want, have anything they want, do anything they want. But it is not the source of happiness. God is the source of happiness. God is the source of joy. And he weds the two together. The world equates happiness with pleasure prosperity, power, and popularity. But 
because the word of God rules in our heart, uh, in our walk, according to verse 1, in the way, then we learn some things. God does bless us. A baby knows he cannot walk on his back or stomach, so he learns to move, then crawl, then pull up, and then falls, but at last he learns to walk. We learn to walk in God's word the same way. I can tell you, no matter how old you are, you're going to be a stronger or weaker Christian 10 years from now, depending upon how much time you spend in the word, how much time you let God's word direct your way, your path, your direction in life. And you're going to stumble. You'll have some problems. You'll have difficulties. But like a baby, you get up and you keep going until God does something in your heart and life. Happiness is found when God's word leads us past a snare, past a trial, past a temptation. We sometimes forget that God can take us around circumstances. I don't like all the circumstances of the world today, but I don't have time to fret over them. I don't have time to sit around and worry because I know somebody that's in charge of everything. And he controls the circumstances. And if I can trust him, then I don't have to worry too much about what's going on around me. I don't have to fret. I don't have to spend time concerned. Why? Because my God takes care of me, and as I read his word and as I study his word, I find that that is true. He's that way because the word of God rules in his heart. Uh, as we looked at verse 2, uh, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and seek him with their whole heart. And then in verse 3, they also uh, do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Because the word of God rules, some things begin to happen in our lives. It brings our hearts into captivity to the word of God. And it brings purpose and direction in our lives. We need that. We need purpose. So many Christians have no purpose in life. It seems like they're just existing. They're just moving from day to day, church service to church service, instead of having a direction and purpose in their life. But if you stay with the word of God, it will give you that. It talks about his testimonies because in it, he testifies of truth and testifies against sin. And as God speaks and we listen, Things begin to happen in our lives. You know, everybody is seeking something. Every person here is seeking something. Every person in the world is seeking something. But you know, as we get into God's word, it changes the direction of our desire. It changes the direction of our wants. It makes us think of things differently. Why? Because God knows what's best. To seek God through his word is the highest purpose that we can begin with to serve him. Now, I know people, and I've seen people. I can tell you that it does happen. There are people that serve God because somebody wants them to, because somebody asked them to, because they feel like they have to. But when you get into God's word and God's word begins to uh, filter through your mind and your heart, then all of a sudden we serve him because we love him. We serve him because it's the best thing. It's the direction that we need. Everybody is seeking something. But to seek God through his word is a very high purpose. And and according to verse 3, it brings our hearts into captivity uh, to the word of God. It brings purity 
to our life. The Lord's secret was the word of God. When he was tempted, he quoted God's word. When he was uh, under trials, he knew that God, the heavenly father, his father was there. His life was ruled by God's word. And then we see the holy man in verse four through six. Notice his duty here in verse four, if you would please. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. We have a command here. We have a duty. This is a command, not a suggestion. Pastor has mentioned a few times teaching on the Ten Commandments. There are Ten Commandments, not Ten Suggestions. This is a commandment. This is something God says. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. If we understand our relationship to him, we understand his commandments. And so we begin to obey them. And not until then will we be free from shame, free from failure, free from defeat. There were 613 commandments in the Mosaic Law. The psalmist here said he was determined to obey them all. Now, I'm sure that you're not a whole lot better than I am. I have enough trouble with the 10. Don't you? We have enough trouble with just a handful. But here the psalmist said he, he was going to, uh, uh, he's commanded to keep those precepts, his word, diligently. Look at uh, uh, verse 5, if you would, please. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Now I see something about his desire. That my inner parts, that my ways were directed to keep his statutes. We need to understand that as God's word will direct us, as God's word leads us, we want more of God's word. When you've had enough of God's word, when you can lay the Bible down and say, I don't need it anymore, you're headed for failure. The reality is, I keep finding those things. That should be our desire. Remember what Paul said in the New Testament? He talked about the word of God and, and he talked about the things that he would do. And he said, there are things that I don't want to do, but I do them. And things I should do, and I don't do them. What's the secret to get past that? You're never going to get per <coughs> excuse me, to perfection, but God's word is the secret for overcoming those weaknesses. Notice his de decision in verse 6. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. He said, I won't be ashamed when I realize that everything that God said is important. Oh, how often do we choose and pick the scripture that we want to obey or that we think is important. Sometimes God says things that I really don't want him to tell me. But he does. And it's those things that are just as important as the things that I want to hear, that I want to know from God. It's those things that direct me and change my path. He wanted to obey all his commandments. What about you? And what about me? Well, again, we see something about a humble man in verse 7 and in verse 8. He says, I will praise thee with the uprightness of heart. Then shall I have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. He's still learning, he says. I'm still picking it up. That's what I was saying just a moment ago. 
when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments, he says. He was not like the Pharisee. You remember the Pharisee in the New Testament stood and prayed with him, uh, the, thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all I possess. Well, the reality is that Pharisee had quit learning and he began to think that he had it all. Be careful. The scripture warns when we think we stand, we're ready for a fall. Be careful to keep growing and learning the Lord. And then he still had a longing in verse 8. I will keep thy, thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Conscious of his failures, conscious of his weakness, the psalmist here promises to keep his laws. He asked the Lord to be patient with him. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Lord, be patient with me. Oh, I'm glad. Aren't you glad the Lord's patient? I'm glad he's not like I am. I tell you, I wouldn't put up with some things. But I have to be thankful because he puts up with me. Aren't you glad that he is forgiving? That he is patient? He's even patient with the unsaved. God is not willing that any should perish, the scripture says, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you glad we have a God like that? We would tend to say, you had your chance. But God says, I still love you. And I'll give you another chance. I'll be patient with you. In the next portion of scriptures, the next eight verses, uh, starting with verse 9, uh, we read some things about the virtue of the word. Verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a man, young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word? It has a cleansing effect. When I begin to look at God's word, it makes me want to be clean. When I, if you look in a mirror and you see your face is dirty, you wash your face. When you look into God's word and you see that your life is dirty, you want to cleanse your life. You want to be there. Think of the pollution that we face every day. In person, we hear things and see things. On the news, we hear things and see things that are just eat away at our lives. We hear cursing. We hear fights. We hear of lying. We hear of cheating. We hear of murders. We hear of all kinds of crime. How in the world can you and I stay clean in a, an environment like this? I mean, this is where we live. This is the society that we're in today. How can we stay clean? Well, I want to tell you, you can't pull up your bootstraps and do it. It takes God's help. We need to begin our day with scripture and prayer. Someone wrote, keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run. There are victories that must be won. Give me power every hour to be true. The psalmist said, how do we cleanse our ways? It's not by turning over a new leaf. He said, by taking heed thereunto thy word. Then it has an, not only does it have a cleansing effect, but it has a controlling effect. Look at verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee, Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Half-hearted commitment is a problem that many of us have. You may disagree with me. This is 
my opinion, but the problem of the Vietnam War was political leaders had a half-hearted commitment. If they'd have turned the military loose, I think we would have taken care of that thing, but we didn't. And so we, with a half-hearted commitment, we did nothing. A half-hearted commitment to keep God's law will always fail us. We'll always come up short. We'll always miss the mark. We need to love the Lord with our whole heart and his word with our whole heart. Those who are fully committed to a cause sometimes seem dangerous. And when we're fully committed to God's word, some people look at us as dangerous. Remember the Apostle Paul? After his conversion, what negative thing did Paul ever do? All he did was preach the gospel. And yet he was in prison. He was beaten. He was stoned, left for dead, and finally beheaded. But he had a commitment to what he believed, and he believed God's word. Yes, we may take stands that are unpopular in the world. That's true. But if you take a stand, some people will like it, those who love God, and those who do not will stand against you. I mentioned this in my Sunday school class this morning. I'll just repeat it very briefly. I learned real quick how to make enemies as a pastor. All you had to do was oppose them installing a gambling facility right over here on Pendleton Pike. And I did. Many of you are aware of that. Others would not be. But I took a stand, and I led the community in that stand. But you would not believe how many people in this community didn't like me anymore. It's strange. I was just taking a biblical stand, I thought. And what was even worse, sometimes it was Christians that didn't like it, that took us to stand against me. But you know what? That doesn't matter. As long as we're doing what God says to do, as long as we're in God's word, as, as long as we listen to his commandments and take biblical stands, it doesn't matter what the world says. Didn't Jesus say, in this world you'll have persecution? You'll have trials? You'll have problems? Of course he did. Why should we expect that we won't? Just because I'm doing the right thing doesn't mean the whole world is going to like it. Well, it also has a correcting effect. Look at verse 11, if you would, please. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy, excuse me, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Now, one of the things the Lord needs to teach me is when I start reading to put my glasses on and I'll get the right verse. But uh, that, uh, I hate these things, but I, I have to wear them sometimes. So uh, I started in the wrong place. But think about this. When Satan tempted Jesus, what did he say? It is written. God's word said. He won with the one weapon that God gave us to win. If God's word was a good enough weapon for Jesus to defeat Satan, it's got to be good enough for us also. He won with that one weapon. You realize that in the Garden of Eden, all Eve had to say without adding anything to it was, Thus saith the Lord. But she didn't. She got part of the command, right? But then she added some words to it. We need to know what God has to say. The more we know the word of God, the more we're going to love God. And the more we love God, the more we're going to love his word. It's kind of a circle. 
I love his word, so it makes me love God. And as I love God, it makes me love his word more and more. And then it keeps me uh, in, in the right direction. It keeps me in the right path. What did Joseph say when he was tempted? How can I do this evil against the Lord? You know what we do? We justify our sin. We justify it because we'll say, well, that person deserves it. But God says we're sinning against him. His word says we're sinning against him. And so we need to be careful. We need to be aware of that. The value of his word is seen in the next few verses. Uh, look at uh, verse 13. Uh, as we look at verse 13 through 16, uh, I, I'm going to tell you we need to proclaim his word, but look at verse 13 in particular here for just a moment. With my lips, I have declared all the judgments of thy mouth. Here's an interesting thought. How can you declare something if you don't know what it is? How can you declare the word of God if you don't know the word of God? Blessed are, are, are people who do that. But he says, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of thy mouth. Wow. If I'm going to declare what God has to say, I best know what God has to say. And where do I find what God has to say? Is it from the preacher? No. He may give you some thoughts about what God has to say. But it's not from him. Is it from another Christian? Well, they may encourage you to go the right way. Sometimes I've seen they encourage you to go the wrong way. It's from God's word. It's the word of God. But... Here's what happens. Now, I know there's nobody in this auditorium that's ever said anything like what I'm getting ready to say. But I've heard it a few times as pastor over the years. Many say, I'm too busy. I just do not have the time to study God's word. My answer to them is very simple. Then you're just too busy if you don't have time for God's word. The things that you're doing are not going to put you in the right path. The things that you're doing are not going to direct you to God. They're not going to make you stronger. They're not going to bring you fullness of life. They're not going to bring you <coughs> happiness. They find time for everything else. But why is it we have no time for God's word? The only way to master it is to study it. And then there's some daring with this diligence. Look at verse 13 again. With my lips I have declared all the judgment of thy mouth. Well, there needs to be Some speaking. You realize that this book is not the most popular book in the world. It's the most published. It's the most purchased. But it's not near the most popular. Publish articles proclaiming God's truth. Take public stands. Teach without compromise and you'll be attacked. In our bankrupt society, we need to return to the gold standard of God's word. And then we must prize it. Look at verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much in all riches. You realize it's priceless. 
The psalmist said, I've rejoiced in your testimonies as much as in all riches. The world wants riches. But I teach you from God's word what God says. And he says if you put his word first, it will be more valuable than the riches that this world can provide. You don't need everything that the world has to offer if you have God's word because it will direct you in the right path and you may have much and you may have little, but God will bring joy and peace and happiness into your life. It's valuable. It's more than all the riches of this world. And it's practical. Look down at verse 15. He says, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Such meditation leads us correctly on the right path. When I study God's word, when I meditate, when I think upon what God has to say, it will move me in the right direction. It'll take me down the right path. When I come to that Y in the road where there's a broad way and a narrow way, uh, I know that that verse is talking about uh, the way of salvation, but also we come to that path many times as Christian. It's much easier to take the broad way unless we meditate in God's word and then it's easier to take the narrow way. God's path. So he says we should meditate on it. It does that. Such meditation leads us correctly. But there is a deceiving way that the world has for us. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a way that seems right, humanly speaking. Hey, there's no logical way a church can exist financially. Do you know how many million the facilities are worth here? They're worth quite a bit. Try to buy insurance for it, you'll see. The reality is this. The facilities cost a lot of money. How did we pay for this? How did we build this? How did it all come to pass? A handful of people giving their tithes and offerings? Well, that makes no sense. The world says that that can't happen. But God says, you do what I tell you and I'll make it happen. And it happened that way. You see, the way man looks at things we're doing the wrong thing. You're wasting your time coming to church. You're wasting your time reading the Bible. That's the way man looks at it. But the way God looks at it, it's the thing that's going to direct your path, that's going to help you. And then we prove God's word. Look at verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. The psalmist said, the best way to keep it alive is to prove it, to put it into er everyday life. So he says, I'll delight myself in thy statutes, and I'm not going to forget what you had to say. I'm not going to forget your word. Put it into your everyday life. Do you realize that the Bible abounds with working principles for life? There's principles that if we'll just listen to what God has to say, he will show us that it works. Put God's word to the test. Put it to the test. And you'll find out that God always keeps his word. Let me close with an illustration. Uh, I'll not give a name. Some of you probably will figure it out, but that's okay. Every January, as a pastor, usually I taught on tithing. We had a man that had been in our church for a little over a year, I think, just about a year. And he came to me, sat down in my office with me. 
says, Preacher, I hear what you're saying about tithing, but it just can't work for me. I can't afford to tithe. Well, my philosophy always was you can't afford not to, but that's a, another lesson. And so I went through it again, and I said, put God to the test. He said, if you would tithe, he would pour you out a blessing that you could not contain. Now, we understand that all blessings are not financial. I, I trust that you understand that. But I, I told him, do that. He looked me in the eye and he says, Pastor, you've never lied to me. I'm going to try it. I'll do it. And he did. But you know how good that makes you feel as pastor. You, you, you really helped this guy. About three or four weeks later, he had a heart attack. He's in the hospital. I'm going to the hospital to make the visit. And I said, to him, uh, I said to myself on the way, what am I going to tell him now? I've got myself in the corner. And so I walk into his room. And to my surprise, he looked up and he said, Preacher, I'm so glad you taught me to tithe. Okay. He said, my boss called me. And he said, the insurance that I had on you is not as good as I thought it was. And it's not going to give you as much as I thought it would give you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take and have your wife pick up your paycheck just like you were working every week. I'm going to give you your full pay this whole time that you're off, which was a few months. And he said, when it's all over and you get the uh, uh, insurance money, you can give that back to me. You will have had a full pay. Uh, thank you, Lord. So he gets well. He gets the insurance. He takes it to the uh, employer. And he says, here it is. And the employer looked at him and he said, you know, the Lord has just blessed my business. I want you to keep that money too. And I could go on and on with the story. It gets better and better. But my point here was, have you ever tested and see if God's word is not true? He found that it was true. Never had any problem with him tithing after that. That was just the way it was. So my point here is, the Bible abounds with working principles. Grab a hold of them. And you'll see that they work. Let's stand for prayer. As we take just a moment, I realize this is a simple message on a simple psalm, but it's an important message because God's word is our solution. I don't know what your problem is, but God has the answer. I don't know what difficulty you're facing, but God has the answers. Take God at his word. Let God show you that he can keep you, bless you, make you stronger, and help you through every situation that you now or ever will face. Heavenly Father, as we continue and take just a moment to search our hearts, I ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us, draw us close to you, help us to see the importance of your word, what it means to each of our lives, what it can mean for me, what it can mean for every person here. I know that we find many reasons why we don't have time, why we can't meditate in your word but therein lies the answer why would we turn away from the solution help us to turn back to your word to find the answers and the principles and the doctrines
for life. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we sing together softly and tenderly. God speaks to your heart. Here's a place for you to pray. If, if you need to come to the altar, now's the time to do so. Why not commit yourself to get, getting back into God's word? Why not commit yourself to, to begin to memorize some of God's word, to study God's word so you can be what God wants you to be? It's God's word that makes a difference. It's not coming to church. It is God's word. Will you do that? Softly and tenderly, page 326. Softly and tenderly, Jesus. Thank you very much, Pastor Mitchell, if you don't mind going back there so people can have a chance to go back there and maybe not shake, shake his hand, but maybe just talk to him just a little bit, let him know how much you appreciated that message um, about, the, about the importance of the power of the Word of God. Amen. And so just a couple of announcements. Real quick, um, a couple of a prayer request. Um, Brenda Soto, did she hurt her leg here at church this morning, or is it an ongoing thing? I just started hurting after ser service, something with her knee. Well, she called Tony uh, just this uh, while the service was going on and asked um, him to take her to the ER. And so she's, so they're headed to the ER right now. Uh, she's just in a lot of pain, different things like that. So once I know more information, um, we'll get um, a text out. We'll get an email out to everybody. But be praying for her. Um, and Tony, Tony, of course, has got to work, and she's got her um, daycare that she has to deal with. So be in prayer for the Soto family. Hopefully everything is okay with that. Um, also, just be in prayer for Pastor and Mrs. Salazar as they're away, um, getting some much-needed rest. And so just be in prayer for them. Um, and then be back here this Wednesday. Uh, we have several things going on, and so we are starting up Kids for Christ this Wednesday, okay? Primarily, let me say this this way, primarily for the ones here that would, for the kids that would be here anyway, okay? Usually the kids that are here on Wednesday nights, all right? I know there's about eight to ten of them. Um, and then slowly we will bring in kids from the, the academy and kid, maybe kids from um, neighborhoods, whatever it might be. And so be in prayer for that. Also be in prayer for um, our anniversary next week. Um, and then this Wednesday also, um, it, Brother Dave is going to be preaching, and so um, that's always um, a good time. So make, make sure you're here for this Wednesday as Brother Dave preaches. Um, but also just make sure that you are preparing for um, um, anniversary next week, bringing in um, your meal um, so you can heat it, eat it here on the grounds. Or if you can go out, we just ask that you go out and you be very, very quick and come back and be here about 120, 125 as Pastor Mitchell and Pastor Salazar will be preaching in both of those, both of those services, okay? And then, what, yes, sir. Lessons about, you know, eight to twelve minutes usually, something like that. And any kind of craft, whether it's baking cookies, um, I had, um, I won't say who it is. Maybe many of you might be able, be able to guess who it was, but um, somebody that comes you, mostly on Sunday mornings, he said, "Well, I, I can't teach kids a lot of things. I mean, I could strip down and clean an AR-15 if they, if you think the kids would like that." I, I don't know, maybe, I guess, if you want to do that. But, you know, there's always something for all of us, all right? Uh, but anyway, and so just be in prayer for that. Also be in prayer for, um, I think I have an idea, and I'm going to propose it to Pastor, of how we can do trunk or treat. 
um, even during this COVID age, um, very safe and very um, effective for either the people of Lawrence, the kids of Lawrence, also for protecting ourselves. And so I've got a, a pr couple of ideas about that, good ideas about that. I hope, I think they're good ideas. And so be praying about that. I am really, I don't know about you guys, but my heart is still for the people and for the kids of Lawrence and of Indianapolis. And it just kills me that we really can't do soul winning and visitation, different things like that, like we've been able to. So be praying, be praying for that. Be praying that um, the Lord just uh, provides a cure or that it just goes away. Continue to be praying for the election and everything will be okay. All right. We look forward to seeing you this Wednesday at church. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful, Lord, for your love and your many blessings. Thank you so much for Pastor Lord and the 38 years that he was pastor of this church, Lord, the over 50 years that he was in service, Lord. I just thank you so much for him. We pray, Lord, now for Miss Mitchell, Lord, that you would heal her body up and uh, you would raise her up, Lord. I pray that you please be with um, all the other ones that are sick or not well. I do think of Miss Soto, Lord, Miss Brenda, Lord, and uh, she's on her way to the ER, that you would be with her, be with the doctors, Lord, and just help her, Lord, to figure that out. Uh, be with Pastor um, Salazar and Mrs. Salazar as they're. Um, out, Lord, and as they travel back at the, at the end of this week, Lord, just be with them. Just give us a good rest of this week. Bring us all back on Wednesday, God, and just help us, Lord, to serve you with all of our heart. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Amen.